So I'm here to talk to you. I'm David from Fairfield County. I've been no tilling since 1971. Been using cover crops since 1978. They call me the expert, but I still have a lot to learn. I still make lots of mistakes every day, seems like. Uh, and probably the greatest thing that's happened is this large reddish you see on the slide has made me famous. Well, that happens to be the biggest one of how we've ever grown. And uh, we'll talk about that as being our many storage tanks throughout this profile. We talk about cover crops and we really want to change our mentality about cover crops and call them a biological primer. The reason is that RMA, or our crop insurance agents, think when we plant a cover crop, we're going to harvest because it has crop after the name. So as you use cover crops, you need to notify your RMA agent so he knows. Tell, call a biological primer. It will totally confuse them, and we won't have trouble with using cover crops in, in our crop insurance programs. Uh, just want to reminisce a little bit. You know, I'm getting old enough. I'll soon be 70. So we started in 71. Everybody, when I talk to them, they say, well, how can you pull a no-till planter? It takes a lot of horsepower. I throw this picture in just to show you that no matter how big the planter is, it only takes a four horsepower with a two-row planter. So uh, that kind of goes really going home to a lot of people in the 70s. Uh, and I want to show you how the equipment has changed. I was talking to Great Plains uh, dealer over here in the corner, and uh, he'd probably never seen the first no-till grill. So this was the first snow trail made back in the early 1860s, and this was a zip seeder, and this is what we started with. You know, and just a picture of the profile, most of the farm we farm is on highly erodible ground. Uh, presently, we have 23 landlords, less than five acres. Our largest field is 40 acres that we farm, but we farm 1,250 acres. We were fortunate enough in October to have the National NRCF chief in our house to kick off the new incentive for NRCS, which is soil health. If you'll check that plot of dirt he has in his hand right there, I think that was the first piece of dirt he ever felt. <laughs> you know? uh, he was really surprised what we were doing with our cover crops behind his shoulders there and what was going on. He was so impressed a week later after he left our farm and quit. <laughs> or he thought he made a mistake by talking about soil health, you know. Uh, of course, here's our radishes uh, in the field behind our house with winter peas. And we begin with talking about using single species covers, which is what we have done since the 70s. Uh, and this happened to be rye, planted out of our white planter in 15 inch rows at 15 pounds per acre. I like to see a thin standard cover. Our farm is almost all Crosby and Bennington soils without tile drainage. We have to rely on our cover crops to draw all that moisture out of our clay soils. We also have to rely on the sunlight and wind to help do that on the surface. So if you have a rye toothache, the sunlight and the wind can't get down and help dry it out. And we found that the thinner standard covers we have, the better we can control them, the better we have for equipment adjustment and things like that. Here we're planting soybeans on April 28th in rye that was spread out of fertilizer on Thanksgiving Day. This represents 50 pounds of rye with 50 pounds of potash just spread out on top of the surface. The snow worked it in the ground, it grew, and it worked well. The reason we do this is uh, my wife and I, and a part-time hired man runs the farm. My wife does most of the rye planting in the fall. When you give her a 56 pound bag, she has to lift it above her head. She's only good for about 200 acres. After that, she's hunting some easier way to get it done. You know, because I'm still sitting in the cab having fun shelling corn. What happens after it rains the first day of May and you're out for two weeks? Then you get to stand in the field like this and see if what you can do about it. You know, the ride does grow fast, uh, and it's not a problem. Everybody calls and wants to know what to do with it. I just tell them to run over it and plant it. The great thing is when you're done and you're looking back over the seat in the field and you're leaving the gate and it's all laying flat, you know you got to plan it. If you've got a little bit stand up in the corner somewhere in the middle of the field, just go out and hit it again because you missed it. You know. Here we're planting beans in that tall rye and you can see how well the planter's running through it. And here's the results of that 
field being planted without a herbicide. We use a crop roller. And the only weed you see is some, a little bit of poke weed coming up here. And I give my wife a hoe and she would not cut those off because I don't do that, you know. So uh, those are the only weeds that we had in that problem there. The results that we're really tickled about is we have lots of biomass on the surface from the rye. We have good looking soybeans. These beans last fall, or two years ago, made 72 bushels. We use hairy vetch on the very tops of our clean ops. The reason we do that is hairy vetch stays green all winter. This is a slide representing 12 pounds of the acre. Hairy vetch normally costs about two bucks a pound, so that's like $24. When you have hairy vetch like this that you can plant into, it's a nice thick carpet. The planter works well. You can see, you can see the mark of the planter and everything there. You can see how nice it lays down the hairy vetch as you run over it. If the vetch is starting to bloom and you run over it like this, it will die. So you don't usually need to use a burn down herbicide. Austin winter peas has been our primary legume crop for the years. We light them after wheat. These are sowed about 30 pounds with the drill. They cost about 65 to 75 cents a pound. So you end up with about 24 to 25 dollars an acre. What we see with this is we have modulation at the top inch and a half, two inches, a small modulation that breaks down real early in the spring when we're planting corn, where we have the first two roots of the, of the seedling coming out. At B4 to B5, when it's determining how much corn you're going to produce, how many rows of kernels are on the cob, how many rows are long they are, our roots are down in this organic matter here telling that to produce 200 bushel corn. In August, when it's discerning how much it's going to weigh, we have corn roots going down nine inches deep. When we have nodulation like this from our winter peas on our farm, we can count on 180 to 200 pounds of nitrogen. So we do not need to buy additional nitrogen for our corn. This happens to be a 14 inch spade profile. George talked about how the roots hold the soil Look at these clumps of soil here, and right here's a little root, and that soil is being attached to that root. But I also want to show you we have nodulation on the surface, nodulation at the top of the subsoil, and at 14 inches deep in our subsoil pattern, we still have nodulation. This is after, this was planted on August the 1st, and this was September the 1st. This is how much these plants have grown in a month. This is a picture of our soil at home. In 1972, this was yellow clay. This is Cardington yellow clay with a half percent of organic matter. Last fall when the chief was there, we dug this out, showed it to him. Same soil type called Cardington, clay bone soils, has an organic weed in 7.5 today. We have changed that soil seven full percentage points. What did that mean to our operations? That meant with seven changes in the percentage points of organic matter, we now hold 27 inches of water per year. Really made a big difference this year in limited rainfall. How, how many years was that? It took 40 years to do that. 40? 40, 40, 40, 40 years ago. Here's just another shot of our soils, and you can see how granular it is. The reason I took this is we have that chisel plow and moldboard plow, uh, deep ripper working right there for me. And he's telling me thanks a lot for having that cover crop there. Again, here's some more. This is called chickling vetch. On our farm, <coughs> we've tried lots of covers. If they don't work very well, they only get one shot because I don't have time to mess with them. But they don't work for us. Don't make us money. What we disliked about our chickling vetch was 30 days after planting, it bloomed. Another 10 days, it made seed pods that you see down here. What did it do as far as nitrogen retention? If you'll notice, there's no nodulation on the roots. This is a legume, just like our winter peas should be. Why is there not nodulation here? It moved all the nodulation to, the, to make seed production. We never want a cover crop to bloom or go to seed on our farm because we lose the ability to retain nutrients. We also have our deep ripper here. 
And he'd come out there and said, thank you, Mr. Brandt, for giving me this organic matter to grow in. If we have healthy soils, we can have large earthworms. You know, I really enjoyed this, this thing. This is a 17-inch earthworm. It's not a native of Ohio, though, I have to tell you. I was in Texas a month ago, down at Jonathan Cobb's farm. They have 4,500 acres of cover crop this first year. The first spade full we dug out was this earthworm. His dad was with me. His dad says, I don't like what my son's doing. Can you talk him out of it? And I said, no. He goes, look at the earthworm you have. And I guess everything in Texas is bigger than in Ohio. <laughs> And all new crop or new farms that we take over. We only get them after everybody's worn them out and they won't produce. They're always got hard pans and surface problems, those kind of things. The first crop that every farm gets that we work with is buckwheat. This is 20 pounds of buckwheat. We typically normally plant this early spring before we plant corn. If the ground is warm enough and if there's no more temperature below 30, 40 degrees because this will freeze off at 34 degree air temperature. So we have to make sure it's higher than that. By doing this, the buckwheat has a root system about three to four inches deep. It's real fibrous. It, it gives off an acid to help break down the soil profile. And we bring up about 12 or 14 pounds of phosphorus for our next year's crop of corn. Really helps to jumpstart our soil health for our years. This is a new one we're trying, it's called Brasilia. Uh, it's pretty expensive, it's about $6 a pound. About a half a pound per acre is what you see sitting there, so that is plenty. The only thing this does is it has a tremendous root system. This is a 30 grade growth window, but one plant, you cannot put all the roots in a five gallon bucket. That's what we like about it. It would be 42 inches deep in about a month. It really grows well, likes cool soils. This is an awful busy slide, but what I wanted to show you was we started in 1983 with yield monitors with cover crops. We didn't know, no one could tell us how much nitrogen our cover crop was producing. Wherever where we went, we tried to figure this out. So what we did, we took all our fields that had lagoon type covers. We put 180 pounds on some of the field, 100 pounds on part of the field, and then 50 pounds on part of the field. And I guess what I'm trying to show you is when we use 50 pounds of nitrogen, we never lost yield. We never lost yield. We always made money. So that proved to us that we didn't need to use this 185 or 200 pounds of nitrogen. The yellow bar shows that this was a corn bean rotation without covers, and we still out yielded with 50 pounds of nitrogen where we had the goons growing in those fields. That's how we determine what was going on with our fields. <coughs> this is two watersheds, about 20, about a half a mile from our house. This is our watershed here. There's about 1,400 acres on it. There's 900 acres on this watershed. This is a picture taken a year ago after a half inch of rain. We took a sample of this soil right here. They were losing 9.3 ton of soil per acre after a half inch of rain. This soil here had 250 pounds of soil in the sample that we took. <coughs> Conservation tillage and no-till and cover crops really packed. Just a shot I took at home I really thought was great. This is the greatest thing that we've bought in the last 10 years. We plant corn, soybeans, cover crop, and wheat with this planter. The reason we like it so well is we could use a soybean plate we can put winter peas in there. This happens to be a sugar beet plate. It has reddishes right here. There's 45 to 5,000 pounds of seed in a winter pea. There's 45 to 50,000 seeds in reddishes per pound. Here we're using it, and this is the results we get. We have 15 inch planter spacings, 30 inch rows of reddishes, 30 inch rows of peas alternating back and forth. This represents one pound of reddish, 15 pounds of winter peas, for a total cost of about $17.50 an acre. Makes a really cheap cover crop to do what we're trying to do. What are we trying to accomplish? Our, winter pea, or our reddishes ended up being spaced like kernels of corn. 
four and a half inches apart. This is a soil profile of 14 inches deep. These tubers are 14 inches deep here. The tap root goes for another two and a half inches, two and a half feet. Really loosens the soil. What we saw was that as we put two plants together, they became more diverse. The winter peas produced more nodulation, bigger nodulation. The reddishes grew bigger. This is a tap root, there's the soil level. 24 inches deep here in the soil. The, the tap root went another 36 inches deep. Guess what that can do for your green? Water infiltration. The reason I like the reddishes so well in a row, as they grow, they tend to lift the soil three to five inches. They pull the soil up. Gives it a lot of, a lot of room for that <coughs> soil to move and air to come around. This is what it looks like on March. We do have a little volunteer wheat. My John Deere dealer tells me if I get rid of my silver cedar, I wouldn't have that trouble. But I haven't been convinced quite yet, you know. Uh, here we are at planting time, April 22nd, 2009. We plant right down the reddish row. Yes, there's some holes there, but we have never seen the corn too deep in that reddish row not to come up. When that fluted corn double disc runs over that reddish row, it fills it clear full of soil and it's level with the surface. Here it is uh, about two and a half, three weeks after planting. And you can see how nice it is. The corn's coming up. This is like a loofah sponge. We have a farmer's market that we go to. I try to talk my wife into using dowel rods, gluing them in there, and selling those for loofah sponges to scratch them back. But that just don't work very long. She doesn't like to pick them up either. You know. But here's Here's the thing I was really wanting to show you. This is our corn with no nitrogen and no real fertilizer on June the 10th, but there's our reddish row. Look how we have got a natural strip fill machine, a natural subsoiler. Just think how much water we can infiltrate when we get a rain. We try to plant a half to three quarters inch off of a reddish row because it's usually warmer and there's more nutrients there. There's the peas and the reddish. Again, what does it mean? Do we make money by planting peas and radishes? This is a five year study from four fields. And this is the average nutrients that we found in the soil the day we planted the corn each year. We found 250 pounds of nitrogen, 23 pounds of phosphorus, 230 pounds of potash, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. I think that's enough to grow 200 bushels of corn. I know it's enough for Dave Brand to do that. And here's some things we're working with. Uh, this is a neighbor's farm we just rented two years ago. It's had two years of no-till. We have peas and radishes on this eight acres. We have a waterway that separates it, same soil types. This is a 10-way plan. This is the newest thing we're working with. It's trying to use more species to do more diverse things in the soil. So there's sun hemp with radishes. Sun hemp is a warm season lagoon. It grows about six foot tall, has nodules the size of a quarter, freezes off when it reaches 34 degrees. Shows me lots of promise in our blends that we're using working with. These are fava beans, which was a disaster because we didn't have enough ground cover. Uh, you can see here that our reddish row kind of froze out a little bit. This reddish, when we dug it out, it goes out of the ground nine inches tall. When we dug this out, it went through the hard pan, it was three inches thick. It was in a ditch in diameter going through the hard pan. Once it got through the hard pan, it was three inches big, the tuber, and went another 18 inches deep. Why did they come out of the ground? I think they haven't tapped enough weight with the rate of the reddish and the top growth to keep pushing that root through the system. That's why they jump out of the ground. Uh, this is a six-way plant that a fellow in North Carolina has used for about 12 years. He is a corn silage cover crop fellow. The last nine years he's had 32 tons of soil, or 32 tons of silage for the last nine years with this cover, without fertilizer, without chemicals. How do we know that it loosens the soil? This is a, 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 a has a long probe on it, tells you how much pressure it takes to push through the soil. And here was the answer. 
This bar on this side was five years no-till with one year of cover. This is five years of no-till. If we looked at 15 inches deep, it took about 112 pounds of pressure to push the probe in the ground where we had cover crop, about 220 pounds of pressure to push it where we had no cover. Does the cover loosen the soil? Yes, it does. It lowers the density. That means we have more water and nutrient infiltration. How do we know how much nitrogen we produce? We use a chlorophyll meter. Some of these are called, now these are called reed seekers. They put them on equipment. You can trust the reeds as you go. If this reads 42 parts per million, we have enough nitrogen throughout the growing season to produce 200 bushels of corn. And here's our results. 229 bushels of corn, 50 pounds of nitrogen. Next year we'll have corn here. The year before this corn was in, this was a pea and reddish field. But look how nice that looks. This is a, probably the neatest thing we've tried in a lot of years. This is called a Savita test. It tells you how much nitrogen is in the soil at any time during the growing season. You take until a jar half full of soil, put this flag in, screw the, lid, screw the lid on tight. 24 hours later, take it off, take the flag out, match it to the color code of the chart. The back side of the chart tells you how much nitrogen you need to corn. Really accurate. Close, as close as if sending the samples away and wait two or three days to get the results back. Uh, this was Jonathan Cow's uh, steer in her field, his bull in his field, and he, she was, we was looking at her. The only thing she was eating that day was this cactus, and we were talking about cover crops, and she was telling me she wanted to have some cover crops in that pasture field to eat, you know. How do we introduce covers with our grill? After we retire hay field, we, we introduce two pounds of reddish with our grill. Our newest purchase is a Miller sprayer. We took the the uh, tank off the sprayer. Uh, we took all the hoses off the boom. We put an air seeder box here. We're blowing uh, seeds every 30 inches, doing it in standing corn. I think it's going to replace the airplane, or I want it to replace the airplane because of the cost of the unit. You know. Here you'll see the unit. Here's the hoses. Here's the drops. We can go through. Seven foot to nine foot tall corn, not freely damaged, made in all the seed, and had the cover crop growing a month before we harvest, which I think is going to be a big plus to a lot of our corn and bean producers. Again, there's the, there's the tube. We have a steeple here. We create a whirling chamber here with our seed so it whirls it out on the ground and evenly distributes the seed in that 30 inch area. We've tried helicopters. Very unsuccessful for us. We've tried airplanes. I feel an airplane is about 75 to 80 percent successful. If it's a really wet fall, that's what you want to use. If you're harvesting the first day of September and it's drier and bone, don't use a plane. It's not going to work. You know. We like to use an aerial seeded plane when our soybeans first leaves are turning yellow. We put our cover crop in, and that seems to work fairly well. Here you can see the cover crop in standing corn. This is uh, winter rye with reddishes for this field to go to soybeans. What's wrong with this picture? Well, you need to talk about moving your residue. We do not like to see residue in windrows. There is no way you're ever going to get your drill or planter to plant whatever you're going to plant where that residue is. Another problem you got is today. So that's be the neighbor's field. Today, that field is loaded right now with seed corn maggot, cut worms, wire worms, those kind of problems. Another thing will happen over here, it'll be too hot and too dry. This will still be wet. Learn to manage your residue. Make your equipment adjustments so it can move the residue to the full width of your header, whichever it is, corn or beans. You can do that. Most of them are hydraulically driven now. All you need to do is speed them up or change the belt fully, and that'll make it work real well. This is some of our 190 bush of corn last fall. We have a cover crop in here growing, but what I wanted to show you was how evenly we can disperse that residue behind our machine. This is what we're after so that you can have good soils penetration with it. Tillage or with the drilling equipment you're going to use 
for the next year. The hottest things we've been doing is working with blends the last three years. And these are our four blends that we were working with. We have blends that have 16,000 pounds of biomass to 11,000 pounds. Why are we interested in 16,000 pounds of biomass? If we can produce 16 to 20,000 pounds of biomass, we can change the organic reading in your soils by 0.75 to 1% per year. We've done it for three years. We can see it happen. We can go from a half percent organic matter soils to 3% soils in three years. We will change it faster than we've ever done it before. But you must have this 25, 20 to 16,000 pounds of biomass. What are we talking about? We're talking about diversity. We're talking about using sunflowers. Why would you use a sunflower? Well, one nice thing, it blooms, got a nice yellow thing, people think you're doing great things. <laughs> what does it do for me? It brings up zinc from the subsoil. We're zinc deficient. When we have two pounds of sunflower seeds per acre, we can bring out four to six pounds of zinc, make it available for next year's crop. We have soybeans, we have sun hemp, we have pearl millet, we have radishes, we have some crimson clover down in here, we have some hairy vetch over here, nine or ten species. What we're after here is to mimic Mother Nature. We have different plant heights, that means we have different root depths. We have roots from five foot to four inches deep. What do they look like a month later? Here's buckwheat. Whole bunch of stuff here growing. It's waist high. This is planted on August 1st. This is October, two months later. If you had cattle, if you had fence, how many pounds of beef could you produce off of this? And this was August when it was dry. You know. We have guys doing this in Kansas. They're putting 50 to 250,000 pounds of beef per acre. And get three pounds a gain a day. This is our plots. Plot A, plot B, plot C, plot D. We plant the corn across. Yes, you can plant into this. It's not a problem. Look at these sunflowers. They draw beneficial insects. Do you realize that there's 3,000 beneficial insects for every one that's not a beneficial? If we all had more than 3,000 beneficial insects on our farm, would we have to use a fungicide or an insecticide? I don't believe so. This is another shot of it. You see how much I like it? I took a lot of pictures of it. <laughs> this was a fun thing. This is pearl millet. This grows out in Kansas, North Dakota. This is their grain. We're out there. Back behind here, you see sunflowers. What we did, we put four or five of these in a bundle. Two sunflowers went to farmer's market, sold about 150 bundles <laughs> one Saturday afternoon. Pretty well paid for the cover crop. Always got to keep thinking outside the box, what can I do with this mess if you got one of them? You know, make it pay. This is our, our high nitrogen plot. It's not very tall, but you can see we have lots of diversity. Lots of green cover. And this is the one I really thought I was going to be in trouble with. This was our 12-way blend with sedan sorghum. My good friend Ray Archuleta says this is what you got to use to create biomass, to change the organic matter, to get the, the cycles working. I sent him this picture to August, when I took it, I think it was August 11th. I said, Ray, how am I going to plant corn in this? He said, don't worry about it, David. I said, okay. <laughs> I worried all winter. <laughs> you know. What does all these blends, blends do to us? Do they suck the moisture out of the soil? Or do they keep moisture in the soil? Our red bar represents corn and beans. No-till. No corn and beans. The other four are blends. If we look at blend two, we have to have eight different species. At the top two inches of level on August the 24th, at 18% moisture in the soil. At the top two inches. We really don't care about the top two inches in August. We care about what's the 8 to 10, 11 inches deep where the roots are. We go 10 inches deep, 22.5% more moisture than where we had no-till corn and beans. Do you know what that meant in our corn yields? This was 120 bushel corn. 
This was 172 bushel corn. Did our 8 and 10 wave lands take care of did they draw the water out of the soil? No, they did not. And this is agriculture research from Dr. Lafitte Islam. So I assume it's right. <laughs> you know, here's the blends again. Here's the interesting thing that I found. After corn harvest, 174 bushel corn last fall. We all would have been tipped with all that if we'd done that well everywhere. Blend one had 54 pounds of nitrogen left, 137 pounds of fodder and phosphorus, and 87 pounds of phosphorus. So you can put totals to all that with the cash value. That meant I was carrying over for this spring soybean ground, $191 worth of fertilizer. Look what happened to blend two. We ended up with 270. Blend three, 245. Blend four, 222. And my standard that I really like because it's easy to do, you just throw it in the corn planter and you plant it. It looks nice. My precision peas and radishes was only 126. They're convincing me we need to do a lot of different species. How do we plant these species? You throw them in the drill box, you set the mark and the gauge in the, for the opening for a third of the size of the big seed. You either make a half a dozen rounds and see if the box is empty, or if it looks like it should be, or when you get done planting, if the drill's empty, you've done a great job, then it's half full, you just do it again. Because you didn't have it done right. What did it mean in corn yields? Peas and radishes. Blue bar in every case is 100% of the fertilizer needed for my corn crop for 200 bushel corn. Red bar is half rate fertilizer. Green bar is zero fertilizer, zero nitrogen. Even though our peas and radishes only average 145 with all the nitrogen, without any it averaged 143, I gained two bushel, spent $225 to get two bushel of corn. That wasn't very good math. So over here with blend, with our 10 weight blend, we went from 155 to 174. Our eight wave blend, which I think is ideal in any situation where you use eight different species. We went from 145 to 174. Seven wave blend was 156 to 174. And our last plot was pretty well up on the side of a 20% slope, and the half rate fertilizer didn't pass. Now, those are what we found with a one year trial from our species. I think there's more research to be done, and I think this will be a way of the future. What did this mean as far as nutrients or what did I produce? This is the corn seed we took out after we weighed it. We sent the samples off to see how much protein was in the corn. Full rate fertilizer, 140 bushel corn, 7.5% protein. 160 bushel corn, half rate fertilizer, eight. Full rate, no fertilizer, no chemical, 9% protein. Didn't make any difference when at the ADM, told them it had 9% protein, 64 pound test weight, they still paid the same price for it. But if I'd have went to a hog producer, or a dairy producer, or a beef producer, it would have netted me 27 cents more bushel. These are some of the things we see that happens with our radishes. We have slugs. Everybody worries about slugs. What do we see? We see less slugs because they eat the radish. Right there, he gave it off. Two days later, the sulfur and the radish collapse their stomachs and just burn them up. They die. We do not have slug problems using radishes anymore on our farm. These are slug eggs. You've not seen them. They're like the size of a lead pencil. Right there they are. We dug them the next week later after this, that would have been around the 1st of December. And those eggs are all black from the fumigate from the reddish. Just remember, when these reddishes do fumigate, when the ground starts to thaw them out, notify the sheriff and the, and the fire department so that they don't get called at 3 o'clock in the morning with every fire engine in the state of Ohio sitting in your driveway wondering where the gas leak is. 
It's not very much fun to wake up that. How do we terminate some of these crops? We use a crop roller. If it rolls the crop, you would not roll the crop in August or in September. You'd roll it when you want to plant. But this happens to be a field day that he's having showing how well it rolls the crop. Here you can see what it did. It puts a nice thatch, even thatch on the soil. When you have that kind of thatch, there is no broadleaf weeds. Very little grass comes through. And you get by with a lot less herbicides. How do we used to do it before? This is how we did it before. You know, this is the way we do it now. There happens to be one setting out here when you look at that I saw coming in. I thought that looked real nice. This is rye grass with crimson clover, aerial seeded into 70 bushel beans this fall on September the 14th. That was the fall of 2011. We planted corn into that this year, and there we are planting corn. You don't need to have a dust cloud rolling in front of you or behind you. It takes less fuel. Pilgrims on your cab don't need to pull the dirt and dust the dirt, less maintenance, less expense to get the crops in the ground. Here's what our cover crops look like in December. So this is 10 wave land. This is that, uh, this is seven wave land. This is that 12 foot tall Pearl Miller front hand that I uh, so Dan Sorkin I was standing in. It was about nine inches tall. Planted corn into it. This is another thing we're trying. We try everything anybody calls and tells us if you've ever tried this. Well, no, but it's worth a shot for us. This is soybeans. Since we have a native planter, when we're planting corn, we shut them off, raise them up. They're just hanging there, not doing any good. Somebody says, well, why don't you plant soybeans to grow nitrogen for corn? So we let them down, put some beans in it. This is 20 pounds of beans. This is the corn, same day. Here's Ray looking at it, telling me there's too much bare ground. We're not going to see any results. You don't have enough diversity. David, you know better than this. Here was my results. We work with the FMA chapter. We have a 12 acre, or 25 acre plot. We put the corn and beans all our ending back and forth with no nitrogen. The five or four varieties here average 190. We moved over, same four varieties. Put 140 pounds of nitrogen on, average 125. One year study. Which one would you like to do? Does it make you think if that bean splitter <coughs> planter that you're planting corn with and not using them other units, maybe it's worth to put some beans, try two or three rounds, see what happens. Pretty easy to do. 20 pounds of beans per acre. Maybe we won't get any results. Maybe we just lucked out. That's 50 bushel better. Something happened, fellas. I don't know what. You know. And this is the result of these blends. Just want to make sure that you understood that there was corn growing in them. Blend one, blend two, blend three did have herbicide because we had triticale here growing. So blend two, three, and blend four had herbicides. Oops, I think we'll quit right there. Can I ask any, answer any questions? Yes? What made me switch over? We had, been, we had no till for four years ahead of that. The third year we saw a loss in corn yields. The fourth year it almost cleaned our clock. We had to do something. You know, I think everybody that done it in the 70s and 80s saw that. And they went back to tillage. We didn't have the opportunity to go back to tillage, but because for me to buy a six row corn planter from an AC dealer, I traded in a chisel plow, a disc, the field cultivator, everything I owned as far as tillage. So all I had was a corn plant. We had to make it work. So then we went to looking for other sources. And the cover crop was answered. Yes? Something I didn't get to because I'm sliding on my side. The front guy was, you know, was able to get to it. Remember Dave's slide about nutrients in his soil, plant in time, he did that five year study. Talked about phosphorus and it's right around 20 pounds or over. If you remember the days of our no-till campaign in the mid-80s and late 80s, 
Ohio State was telling us, we need 40 pounds of fat. Well, if we had 40 pounds, there's no reason to add any more. Well, were they wrong then? Or was Dave wrong? Is 20 pounds not enough? Actually, they're both right. The reason for that is mycorrhizal fungi. Dave has a very healthy population of them. They go out into the soil, make phosphorus that is not available. The soil test shows us 20 some pounds. When those mycorrhizae could have worked, all of a sudden there's a bunch more phosphorus available. The residual fertility in the soil and the secret of Mother Nature is mineralization will feed your crops if you fed the microbes so they can put it there in the first place. Yes. That's right, George. Thank you. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, my son doesn't like to like pouring into cereal rye. Is that a problem? If it is, how late can I plant uh, the crimson clover and the uh, rye grass to plant that corn in? Well, the question is, is you don't like to plant into rye for yeah, corn, no. and I, I would, I would prefer not to plant corn into rye because there's a pathological effect of the rye being a grass, suppressing a grass that wants to grow, and corn is a grass. So that's been a problem lots of times. How late can you plant uh, rye grass and crimson clover? Uh, probably two and a half to three weeks before a freeze. So that would be probably. Your, down here probably October 10th to the 15th, it would probably still grow and be okay. You know, now it's not going to be very tall going into winter, but in the spring it will come, really come on great, you know. Yes? Your, your blends, do you roll those to kill them or do they winter kill them? Most of them have winter kill, unless we have hairy vetch or rye or barley with them. And on our slopey ground, we make sure that we have something green in that blend that will be green to protect the soil. Over oh, winter. Oh, yes, sir. On your slide there where you showed 16,000 pounds of biomass, was that just above ground? That's yeah. above ground, right. 16,000 pounds. And below ground, we had almost 30,000 pounds of root mass in the same area. Yes, sir. I just got back from Cuba about a month ago, and they say don't raise very much corn in Cuba. But where I did see it, they do plant beans in the corn. But of course, the corn population is very sparse compared to ours. Right. Yeah. You know, in South America, they're doing a lot of what they call interseeding in corn crops. Um, to, to supply nitrogen to the crops, and that's where some of these ideas have come from that we're trying. And I think, you know, when we're trying some of these things, we can do it on a small enough scale that, you know, an acre or two of them need to hurt you, but a hundred acre field would make you feel pretty bad, you know. And I think with, you know, most everybody has fairly new combines with yield monitors, and now you really know what's going on by what your yield monitor's doing, you know. Yes? But I, uh, back in the late 60s, I think it was, I um, took a hand so dry grass but in the corn, standing in the corn, you know, about in the middle of summer or summer on in there. So yeah. I thought I thought it was just Well, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting if you go up to Kidron every now and then and you get to see the farm machinery option. Every now and then you'll find a, a five vein drill that a horse used to pull. And our grandparents always used to put something in the corn fields with a drill. I don't know how they stood that corn leaves hitting them in the eyes and cutting their eyes, but you know, or the horse, but, uh, you know, we're not trying to invent the wheel. We're just doing what our parents did because they didn't have nutrients. They didn't have fertilizers and lime and all that stuff then. So they were trying to let Mother Nature do their thing, you know. Yes, sir. So your best guess, uh, I'm trying to try to say your best guess on uh, a blend for around here in Bean and Attenberg, Claremont soils, late harvest. I guess the, the, what guess I would use for here is I would look, uh, and this is probably going to confuse all of you, but I would look at two, two carbon-type plants, and we're talking about carbon-type plants. That happens to be barley, wheat, oats, uh, triticale, rye, or a summer uh, carbon crop would be sedan sorghum, pearl millet. I'd pick one of those or two of those and put it in your blend. I would look for three or four nitrogen sources, and out of those I would use two warm season Nitrogen such as soybeans, sun hemp, and two cold season legumes such as winter peas or hairy batch. Uh, 
would be a choice. And then I would look for two brassicas, which of a brassica is a reddish, a turnip, mustard, grape, canola, those kind of things. And that, that's what you need. You need to kind of play with different ideas. And as you put these blends together, you keep lowering the rate. The ideal seeding rate for a blend is 35 to 45 seeds per square foot. That's ideal. And that usually comes back to about 35 or 40 pounds per acre. These blends normally are costing about a dollar to a dollar 25 put together per pound. What's the latest you get that on? Most of that should be put on so you have at least six weeks before a freeze. You know. So it would, surely it should fall a week, but if our air seeder, or you could do it with an airplane, you could do it in, in mid-August and do it as an air seed type of deal and let the leaves fall on it and mulch it.